Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on the value of adding managed metadata to Microsoft Online Search. My name is Michael Pay. I'm the CTO at Concept Searching, and I lead our UK-based development team in increasing our product offering, mostly these days across the cloud. We work with a lot of Microsoft technologies, but our integration is most heavily focused on SharePoint, both on-premises from SharePoint 2007 onward and SharePoint Online. My contact details are on the screen now, so please feel free to reach out via LinkedIn or email if you've got any questions or comments after the session. And what we're going to look at in the session today is metadata in SharePoint and file shares, both how we can generate it and apply it, and how we can use it to our advantage to drive a great end user search experience, and also how we can use it to optimize the process of migrating content to the cloud from our on-premise repositories. The question is though, what is managed metadata? Well, managed metadata is the name given to terms that reside in SharePoint's managed metadata store, or as it's otherwise known, the SharePoint term store. The term store has been around since SharePoint 2010, and to my mind, it's a great piece of functionality. What it lets us do is have a centralized store of hierarchical metadata that we can apply to our documents and our records that reside in our farm or tenancy. These classifications can subsequently be used to drive reporting on which documents have been tagged with a particular term, and it can also be used to vastly improve the end user search experience. Now, in the world of information management, there are two main areas of classification, taxonomies and ontologies. The key difference between the two is that in an ontology structure, we have a concept of potentially complex relationships, such as James is an employee of concept searching where James and concept searching are the terms. Whereas a taxonomy is a purely hierarchical concept where a term may or may not have parents or children. The term store is built on a taxonomy based structure. This means that the only relationships we can derive are the relationships between parent or child terms. Any other inference that we're looking to achieve needs to be built into why and how we choose the terms to apply. This is really key to my mind because out of the box, the term store has no way of identifying why a document should or should not have a particular term applied, nor does it offer any advice to the end user on how they should select the terms to apply to a particular document. Does this mean we should not use managed metadata though? Of course not. One of the problems we have with normal metadata assignment is a lack of consistency. The term store resolves this issue by forcing the use of terms that have been defined under corporate guidance and approved according to the terminology used throughout the company. The term store also paves the way for us to make changes to terminology without the requirement to update all of our source files. And more importantly, it has multi-language support for companies that cross language barriers. One user can tag a document in his own language and another user on the other side of the world will see that tag in their own language. Most if not all users will now have at one time or another made use of a faceted search experience from selecting the size TV you want to buy to the price bracket you're willing to pay for a house. And all of these benefits that we get from the managed metadata store allow us to very quickly provide an automatically generated faceted search experience with very minimal effort. So what we'll do now is take a look at the term store in SharePoint. Here we have an example of term store. This particular one is sat within Office 365, but to be honest, the, uh, the Functionality is much the same for both on-premise and 365. We can see on the left-hand side we've got a tree view structure, and that speaks to the hierarchical nature of the term store within SharePoint. So at the very top level we've just got a label identifying which term store we're connected to, and beneath that we have term groups. Term groups are just a logical grouping and a way to assign permissions and allow people to only administer a certain section of the term store. Within the term store, we have term sets. Now term sets are typically subject specific. So I've got one here that's called regions and within regions I've got various different regions as you would imagine. Within IPSV I have a number of public sector vocabulary terms. So generally speaking the terms themselves won't always have relationships to each other but the terms will all have a relationship to the term set itself. And it's a way of defining how the users are going to select each term and how many different ways we're going to split out the refinement at the later stage um, in the search experience. So what we'll do now is show how easy it is to create one of these within the term store. So first of all, I'm going to create a new term group and we'll call this demo. 
Now beneath the demo, I'm going to create a term set called time type. Now we're going to imagine in this case that I'm creating a calendar and for that calendar, each block is going to have a particular type. Now the type is going to identify what I'm doing in that particular time frame. So one of them is going to be work, one of them is going to be sport, one of them can be free time. That should be sufficient for now. Now, if I click on the term work, we can see some of the functionality that the term set can offer us. We can look over here and see custom properties. Now, the custom properties are a nice bit of functionality because they allow us to store custom data against each term that we can use later on for various different things. But ultimately, it can, be allow, it can allow us to connect it to an external system if we want to and store information about that external system in the custom properties so we can link back very easily. If I go back to general though, we can also see something that I spoke to earlier, which is the language of the label. So in this case, we're looking at the English language and we've called it work. But what I can very easily do is select from the language dropdown French. And when I do this, we can see that there's no default label for French. Now, what this would mean is if a French user came across this, the type would still be shown as work. But what I can very easily do is just put in the word travail. And what that means is then the French user will see it as travail, the English user will see it as work. But regardless, we can still get the same allocation of the documents without having to have two completely separate metadata terms. So this makes our reporting very, very easy. For the purposes of the demonstrations throughout uh, this session, what we're going to be using is IPSV. And that's because it's a nicely built out taxonomy. It's got lots of terms within it, so we can speak to a lot of the different problems and concerns we might have with term sets. And we can also see the benefits of the refinement that we can get from a nicely structured taxonomy um, when values have been assigned to our whole corpus. So what we'll do now is go back and uh, continue the session on the slides. The next question is how can we push the metadata that we've defined in our term store into the documents that are sitting in SharePoint or sitting on our file shares? The easiest option by far is to roll out user assignment. And what I mean by that is roll out a company policy that the end user upon uploading a document must select the most appropriate term or terms that apply. But, as with most processes involving user interaction, this is liable to have some issues. The first and most frustrating is the variance in user selection. Each individual has a different vocabulary and a different set of experiences. These will undoubtedly directly influence them when they select what they feel are the most appropriate terms for a document. And what this leads to is an inconsistency in the applied tagging, with two users potentially selecting completely different terms for the same document. Equally, there's always the risk that a user may choose to ignore the policy altogether, or select the first option in the list to save them time when uploading lots of content. It also doesn't help in situations where a large amount of content is bulk uploaded, which can lead to many documents without tags. The other issue with this process is that it's very much a static view. If we roll this policy out when there are already a million documents sitting in our SharePoint environment, then our refiners will only cover a very small set of content, the content created post that date, and will have a million documents sitting there without tags. Users will undoubtedly quickly lose faith in the reliability of the search functionality. Alongside this, if corporate terminology changes to include new, more specific terms for a document, we have no way to update the existing documents that it's applicable to. This leads us to a very inconsistent state because we have some documents with no tags, some documents with older, less specific tags, and some with the more recent tags. Ultimately, all of this leads to a really poor end user experience. So I personally believe that user assignment is not a great way to go when the ultimate aim is to improve search with managed metadata. So we've talked about the problems with user-based assignment, but the question is, how can we solve this issue? The approach that we have at Concept Searching is an automated programmatic approach, which is something that we offer as part of our core functionality. What we're essentially doing is deriving the tags for a document by applying a set of pre-configured rules against both the document content and metadata. And what this ensures is that we get a consistent and repeatable assignment of terms across all of our managed metadata fields and documents. And what it also means is that as the corporate terminology changes, the rules can evolve in line to ensure that the newly generated more specific terms that we have can be pushed out 
to drive a constantly improving end user experience so that users do not become jaded with their search environment. Now, automated tagging is by no means without problems. When generating tags, we're constantly fighting a well-known problem in search, known as precision versus recall. We're essentially playing a balancing act of not making the rules so precise that we don't apply tags to anything, but also not so vague that documents have far too many tags. To achieve this, we leverage a number of different rule types, which can help us define our corporate policies in a strict schema. At the more fuzzy end, we have natural language clues. This is where we're looking for specific words or phrases in a document. And this gets us part of the way. But what this may do is include classifications that ultimately make no sense to the overall tagging picture. A good example of this is the word lead. Now, we could be looking to tag documents with lead because it's a specific type of metal. But unfortunately, lead in English is also the word for lead in terms of spelling. And what this means is we're liable to pick up a lot of documents that actually have nothing to do with lead. So what we also need to do is include some more specific rules. Some examples of the more specific rules would perhaps be applying a tag depending on which library a document is found in. Or perhaps we could look at the document based on its author. For example, if the CTO wrote the document, there's a very good chance it's related to technology. So we can incorporate that into our scoring system with our rules as to how we're going to apply our tags. Lastly, we can look at term relationships. The idea behind these is to reinforce rules that say if a document is tagged with one term, it's absolutely not about another. And equally, if it's tagged with one term, it may have some kind of inference that we can boost the term um, in another location. It's by combining all of these rules that we can really build up a great end user experience for search. It's also by using these rules that we start to edge our way towards some of the ontology concepts by defining the more complex relationships between terms. I'm now just going to do a quick recap of where we've got to. So we've taken a look at what managed metadata is, how we can configure it, and also why it can be useful to us in relation to corporate terminology and language barriers. We've also taken a look at two theoretical options for getting our metadata into SharePoint, both user assignment and automated assignment. For the rest of the session, I'm going to concentrate on demonstrating the concept of automated assignment in both SharePoint and file shares, and then finish up with a demonstration of the power of the finders in SharePoint search. With SharePoint, we have a few different options for pushing our automated metadata in. The most obvious is to write directly to our SharePoint fields. We can do this using a variety of SharePoint APIs, including the server-side constructs most commonly used in on-premises instances, and also are available in uh, Office 365 if we leverage a sandbox solution. And we can also leverage the various client-side APIs that are accessible via both REST endpoints and the strongly typed classes, otherwise known as the client context. If, however, we don't want to write directly to the source system, we do have one other option in our on-premises environment which is to leverage a Microsoft product known as the Content Enrichment Web Service. And what this allows for is a dynamic API call at crawl time, which will support the injection of additional metadata. In this case, our managed metadata that's been automatically generated. Unfortunately though, this is not available in SharePoint Online, so I'm not going to go into any more detail in this session. What I'm gonna do now is jump across to SharePoint and we'll take a look at how we can get the metadata automatically into the SharePoint fields. So what we have here is a fairly typical SharePoint document library sat in Office 365. Got a number of columns on the library, most of which actually are managed metadata columns. So these three here, IPSV, Enterprise and Workflow, are linked to term sets that reside in our managed metadata store. And if I go across the document library settings, we can see we've got the field type managed metadata attributed to them. And what we can also do if we go through to the field configuration is see how that field links back to the term store. So in a similar way as we saw in the term store itself, we've got a tree view structure which allows us to link to the term set. And what this essentially does is restricts the available terms to be selected into a managed metadata field to the terms that are available in this term set. And that's how the whole concept of managed metadata works in terms of applying the metadata to the documents. So I'm saying for the IPSV column, I'm going to allow multiple terms to be associated and I'm going to select those terms from the IPSV term set. 
So what I'm going to do now is go back to the SharePoint document library and showcase a couple of different ways that we can push the metadata into the SharePoint fields. So first of all, what I'm going to do is do a bulk upload. So I'm going to take a load of documents and throw those into the document library. Now, I've got a background process that's running right now that's going to pick up on these documents coming into the document library. It's going to apply the rules that allow the automated generation to occur. And then it's going to take the terms that it's calculated and push those into the document library automatically using client-side APIs, specifically the client context. While we wait for that to occur, what I'm going to do is upload another document, but this time I'm going to do it in a singular fashion. So if I grab this particular one here and upload it. Now in this case, what we're actually going to do is use some JavaScript code that's sitting on the page to perform the same rule analysis on the document as the background process is going to. But this time what it's going to do is do it on the fly and use the JavaScript API that are available through SharePoint to immediately push the metadata onto the page, which we've just seen happen now. So we've now got those tags applied to the document within a few seconds by applying those automatic rules. And what we haven't had to do as an end user is try and identify the most appropriate tags having gone through all of the tree structure, which obviously is liable to take quite some time, particularly given if there's lots of different subtrees and lots of different sub nodes, it will take quite a while to drill down. And this is where a lot of the problems with user assignment comes in. Not only is it perhaps a slow process to find the appropriate terms, but also people were liable to choose different terms. They may well get down far enough to see hazardous substances and consider, well, asbestos is a hazardous sub substance, so just select that but not select asbestos. So they don't get the more specific granularity of what type of hazardous substance it is. If I now go out of here, what we should see uh, in the background, as occurred, is the background process should have pushed the metadata in for the remainder of the document. So if I refresh the page in the document library, the background worker that was running while I was uh, discussing and demonstrating the singular upload will have pushed the metadata for all of those documents in There we go, we can see quite quickly and easily, we've got almost 100% coverage of terms applied to all of the documents within the document library. And this is why I personally feel automate, the automated approach is far better to provide a great search experience. There's not, no way a user is going to sit there and select the 20 different nodes that have been automatically assigned based on the rules. But what we've got now is all of those tags attributed to these documents that we can leverage later on to provide that great refinement in the search experience and build up the kind of experience the end user needs to find documents quickly and effectively. So that demonstrates a couple of the different ways that we can use the SharePoint APIs to push these managed metadata values into SharePoint. We've looked at how we can push metadata into SharePoint. And I'm now going to talk about and demonstrate the value of pushing metadata directly into files sitting on our on-premise file systems. Unfortunately, the process is not quite as simple as when we're working directly with SharePoint. Uh, in SharePoint, we have several unified APIs which allow us to update all document types with a single API. Unfortunately, with the file system, we're at the mercy of the available APIs for the specific document type, if indeed there are any. And ultimately, this logic is dependent on the concept of metadata properties existing in the documents themselves. For example, office types, old and new, and PDF files. The biggest restriction to my mind with writing to the file system is that you immediately lose the SharePoint UIs to see the terms that have been applied to documents. So some thought does need to go into how you can view these classifications, particularly for document types where you cannot write to the file itself. As before, we do also have the option to leverage the content enrichment web service in our on-premise SharePoint environments. This gives us a single method by which we can add metadata to both SharePoint content and file shares, as well as any other repositories that our SharePoint search environment is crawling. What I'm now going to do is demonstrate how this works and the use cases that we might have for this. What I'm going to do now is bring up a before and after example. So both folders that I'm bringing up have the exact same content. 
The only difference is that one of them has been subject to the same rules that we apply to our SharePoint library. So over here, we've got the before concept. So I can demonstrate the fact that this hasn't been touched by any of our rules if I open the document up. Now Microsoft Word gives you a user interface where you can view the custom properties. So if I go through to that now, we can see that we've got absolutely nothing sitting within here. It's completely blank. And equally, if I open the same document in the after example, we should see a vastly different story. So I open up the advanced properties here and go to custom. We see three custom properties. Now, all of these match term sets that exist within our SharePoint term store. We can see the IPSV one here as before with our other example in SharePoint. And we've got the values written in a very specific format. And this is actually the format that SharePoint uses when it promotes and demotes metadata from uh, the SharePoint library itself to the document and vice versa. And that also allows us to work with SharePoint in quite a cool way, which I'll demonstrate later. Now, operating on the file system in this manner gives us a couple of really nice benefits. The first is that it massively helps us when we're trying to optimize the process of taking content from our file system up to SharePoint. And this can be done in a few different ways. A good example of it would be when you're looking for sensitive information. So if we're migrating all of our file system content up to SharePoint, we have a risk of copying data up that perhaps shouldn't be seen by the public or shouldn't be seen by people across state borders. Um, what we can do is identify that using very specific rules that look for problems in files and exclude those files from the migration. What we can also try and do is put specific sets of documents into a particular category where perhaps they're different versions of the same document. So we can try and basically perform some kind of duplicate detection. And that could be duplicate in a couple of different ways. That could be because we have two documents um, that have been kept in two different places. Or it could simply be that we've got 60 different versions of the same file as it's evolved over time. And we can work out what we want to do in terms of migrating that content, whether we need to copy all the versions or just one. Another really good example, I think, with this functionality is if we're looking to do this as a gradual process, rather than taking all of our content straight to the cloud, we just want to move perhaps an individual department. So we could look at moving just the HR documents. But because they've all been sat on the file system, they're across lots of different folders, so we don't actually know where all of the HR content is. We can run our rules, get the classifications for all the HR specific terms, and identify a nice neat subset of the HR content. So instead of having to leave a vast sections of our file system content up to the cloud, we can move just the HR specific documents. And I think this is particularly valuable when in the cloud, you're starting to pay for your usage in terms of network, and you're starting to pay for your storage. Now, you don't want to move all of your content up there. We need to be quite clever about the way that we move content, um, in particular when you're looking at particular types of information that may be in these files, if there's any risk of them containing credit cards or addresses, for example. The other really nice benefit that we get from writing in this particular format to the files is that we can uh, basically circumvent the process that we were looking at before in SharePoint. So I'm going to take a few of the documents and drag them into my SharePoint library, but I'm going to take it from the before folder to begin with. So if I drag these into SharePoint, what's going to happen is SharePoint will do the process of document property promotion. So it's going to try and drag as much metadata from these files as possible. But as we know in the before folder, they haven't been subject to our rules and they have no metadata in them. So these files have been uploaded and they've got no tags. Now that means a couple of things. One, it means that the background process needs to try and identify these and process them sometime in the future. And two, what it also means is that if the search crawler picks these up right now, we're going to have documents in our search experience that don't have applicable refinement tags. So we're going to have gaps in our refinement essentially. Whereas, if I take documents from the after folder and drag those in, what I can do is completely circumvent the process that we had before with the SharePoint um, rules that we were applying and get the meta metadata directly into the library. So not only does that make the process completely safe in terms of making sure we never have gaps in our refiners, but it also means that we get a massive speed improvement because we don't have to introduce any SharePoint APIs to get the metadata into SharePoint. We let Microsoft do all of the work in dragging the metadata out of the files, and we get the benefit of writing all of the rules on the local system, classifying them on the local system, which is extremely fast. 
and then get the metadata into SharePoint immediately for the first crawl of that document. And I think that can be a really powerful piece of functionality. It makes it very much easier for the end user, particularly via the search experience. So we've now seen a good few ways that we can get our metadata onto our documents, whether that be in our file systems or in our SharePoint experience. But we haven't really seen those, the value that we can truly get from this from the point of view of improving findability within our organisation. So I'm going to demonstrate now the refiners in SharePoint and how nicely they can work when utilising managed metadata within document libraries and within the file system when we're uploading our content and how quickly these can be configured to improve findability within a library. So I've got here a typical search page. We've got here a search for the word oil, and we've got a number of documents. And as we can see, because of the way that Microsoft Search works, all of them are just picking up on the word oil on its own. It's just a standard keyword search that is looking specifically for that. So to add the refiners, all I have to do is edit the page, once I'm in the edit mode, I can change the refiners that I've got configured on my page by clicking on the arrow and clicking edit web part. And then I can choose the refiners that I want to apply. And in my case, what I'm going to do is choose a refiner, a refinable string, sorry, that is connected to the IPSV property that we've been working with. So I'm gonna add that in and I'm gonna move it up so we see it at the top of the list and just give that a nice display name. So we'll call it IPSV. Now that I've added that, when I do a search, what I'm gonna see is a filtered list of the terms that are applicable to the documents in my set. So I won't be given all of the managed metadata terms within the term set. What I'm going to see are just the ones that are applicable to the documents within my search results so that I can quickly refine however many documents there are under that search criteria. So if I search for oil, again, once again, I get my nice large list. But this time, what I have is my refinement panel on the left-hand side. And this is where we can really start seeing the value of having this managed metadata outside. So if I click on environment, that will then filter down my documents some, and I can already see some documents being pushed up the list that I didn't see previously. So I can see there, there's a new one popping up now, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So I can also see now that the refiners have again been filtered and I can see that one of them has come up the list, which is environmental protection. So if at this point I know that my search is actually about environmental protection, I can then click on that as well. And again, my search results will be filtered down. So what we can see is I've now gone from a couple of pages of results to three results specific to the subject matter that I'm looking for in just a couple of clicks. And that is the real value that adding managed metadata to SharePoint search gives. You can really, really very quickly filter search results using these refinement panels on the left hand side and get the accurate results that you need within seconds. From my perspective, this vastly improves the SharePoint search experience because when you're searching for such keywords as oil or other words, you tend to find that you get a lot of results, particularly in large organisations. So having the ability to filter down on subject matter makes the process far, far easier. What I think is really great about these refiners is that we can use whatever we want and get as specific to our own organisation as we want. There are a number of pre-existing taxonomy structures out there, and these provide a great basis for building taxonomies around medicine or law, but equally, we can build out our own specific taxonomies that may even be unique to a specific section of our business rather than the business as a whole. There is also no limit to the number of refiners that we can add to the search experience to help the end user, nor is there a limit to the number of search experiences that we offer. This keeps in mind that the way a member of HR searches may be vastly different from the way a user in engineering searches. Ultimately though, I hope this shows you just how much value there is in adding metadata to documents to improve the end user experience. One last note before we close off, as I haven't yet touched on scalability. There are various considerations that we need to take into account when doing this kind of back-end processing. From the point of view of on-premises systems, it is very fast and there is minimal source system impact. 
But what we've got to keep in mind is it does only support a limited number of files, and we do affect the source files. So should something go wrong, you have affected the raw source content, and you'd have to revert to backups if you had those. Equally though, there are pros and cons to SharePoint as well. With SharePoint, the attributes are separate to the source files, so we know that we won't damage those. And we do definitely keep track of all different file types, but we've got to take into account that this is slower and much less efficient for migrations. And also, using these client APIs does affect the speed of SharePoint. So really, it's a balancing act of working out which one we want to do. We've also got to keep in mind that it's not just a one-off cruel process that we need to do. We may change our rules for how classifications and terms should be applied, or we may just need to look for documents that have changed. Perhaps the back-end processing system would go down for a couple of days while SharePoint documents were changing. All of these things need to be taken into account when knowing how much of an effort this is going to be, particularly in terms of how many documents you need to process. But it is very much achievable. That brings us to the end of today's webinar. I really hope you found it useful and thank you for watching. For more information on the services and products that Concept Searching can offer you, please feel free to drop me an email or visit our website at www.conceptsearching.com. My email address is mikep.conceptsearching.com. Thank you very much.